Have you ever wondered how a nation, once a symbol of freedom and hope, can become a paradox in the eyes of the world? How has Hungary, a nation essential in pulling down the Iron Curtain, come to seemingly question the principles it once stood for? Strategically nestled between the realms of Eastern and Western Europe, Hungary has been a chessboard for empires, and its territory has frequently shifted between different power blocks which have instilled a deep-rooted geopolitical consciousness within the nation, often finding it walking a tightrope between larger powers. In 2003, Hungary stepped into the European Union, marking a transition from a past marred by struggles to a future filled with potential. Historically, Hungary's role in dismantling the Iron Curtain set off a domino effect, leading to the downfall of Soviet communism. As Hungary shook off the oppressive past, it stood as a beacon of hope, offering refuge to Eastern Europeans seeking the West's freedom. Yet here we are, wrestling with a paradox. The country that once held high the torch of Western values now seems to contradict them. This complex perception of Hungary, largely negative within the broader European context, is crafted by the policies and actions of its Prime Minister, Viktor Orban and Fidesz, who perceived the European Union as a declining economic giant with an unpredictable foreign policy. But do you really think there is no chance of Ukraine winning? They stand very little chance of winning without the aid which you are currently blocking. Looking at the fact that NATO is not ready to send troops, it's obvious that there is no victory for uh, Ukra poor Ukrainians on the battlefield. That, that's my position. So who are the Hungarians? And how have they steered their country's course in the past? What propels Viktor Orban? And why does his influence cast a shadow of uncertainty over Europe? And what does tomorrow have in store for Hungary? The history of the modern Hungarian people, also known as the Magyars, began in Western Siberia. From there, the Hungarians would gradually migrate further west, until they settled down in the region known as the Pannonian Basin at the beginning of the 10th century, after conquering it from the Avars and Bulgarians. Eventually, the Hungarians would organize into a unified kingdom, defined clearly by the Carpathians, Dinarids and the Alps. Under the leadership of the House of Arpad, the Hungarians gradually unified the various tribes and organized into a cohesive kingdom. By the turn of the millennium, Hungary's first Christian king, Stephen I, was crowned. By the 13th century, Hungary had evolved into a powerful and prosperous kingdom that encompassed a diverse population. The Pannonian Basin, with its fertile lands along the Danube, attracted various ethnic groups, including Hungarians, Slavs, Germans, and others. This diversity also extended to religious beliefs, as Christian, Muslim, and Jewish communities coexisted within the kingdom. Instead of religious conflict, there was a prevailing atmosphere of religious tolerance. This was quite unusual for the era, given the broader context of the Crusades and the often violent religious conflicts of the time. But the kingdom was severely weakened by the Mongol invasions which devastated Europe during the 13th century. Later, when the Hungarians came under attack by the expansionist Ottomans, it was thanks to John Hunyadi and his Black Army that Hungary managed to halt Ottoman invasion further into Europe. Hunyadi's success coincided with a personal union between Hungary and Poland, which meant a large unified force now stood between Central Europe and the Ottomans. However, the personal union died with the failed crusade of Varna in 1444, when the defending crusaders suffered a defeat. The defeat at Mohawks marked the beginning of Hungary's subjugation to Ottoman rule. Much of Hungary, including its capital Buda, fell under Ottoman control while the western part of the kingdom, known as Royal Hungary, was left to the rule of the Habsburgs. For nearly 150 years, Hungary would endure the hardships of Ottoman occupation, facing cultural and religious challenges as the Ottomans imposed their customs and Islam, until the Habsburg-led Austrian conquest at the end of the 17th century and the general decline of Ottoman power in Europe. As a result, the Hungarians would see their Ottoman masters exchanged for Austrian ones. Meanwhile, the Napoleonic Wars of the early 19th century would lead to the spread of the idea of nationalism all across Europe. 
These ideals would result in the birth of an idea, the return of an independent Hungary. The dream of realizing this would come in 1848, as Europe erupted in an unprecedented wave of nationalist revolutions. As the Hungarian revolution struggled to assert its sovereignty, it faced a severe blow from an unexpected source. The Russian Empire, a staunch ally of the Austrian monarchy, intervened in the conflict to help quell the revolutionary movement. In June 1849, a massive Russian army crossed into Hungary and together with Austrian forces launched a brutal and relentless crackdown on the revolution. Following Austrian defeat against Prussia in the Austro-Prussian War in 1866, the humiliated and weakened Austrians would grant Hungary autonomy within the empire leading to the creation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1867. While Hungary had regained its right to govern many of its internal affairs, it found its nationalist aspirations threatened by the national awakening of ethnic groups within its own borders. Slovaks, Romanians, Serbians, Croatians and Ukrainians all inhabited lands controlled by the Hungarian half of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. As a result, the Hungarians implemented a policy of Magyarization, which aimed to assimilate and promote Hungarian culture and language. As expected, this policy led to growing tensions and resentment amongst the various ethnic groups. As the empire crumbled in the aftermath of World War I, the ethnic minorities within Hungary saw an opportunity. Rising nationalist movements in regions like Transylvania, Slovakia, Ruthenia and parts of present-day Croatia and Slovenia sought independence or affiliation with other countries. So the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was indeed a hectic time. Then in 1918, Hungary formally declared its independence, establishing the Hungarian Democratic Republic. However, the dream of a unified and independent Hungary was short-lived. In the following year, a communist takeover led by Bela Kun brought about the Hungarian Soviet Republic, aiming to establish closer ties with the newly formed Soviet Union. The situation escalated into a series of wars known as the Hungarian-Romanian War, the Hungarian-Czech-Slovak War, and other conflicts with neighboring countries. The most significant and detrimental outcome of these wars was the Treaty of Trianon, signed in June 1920. The treaty imposed severe territorial losses on Hungary, stripping it of approximately two-thirds of its territory and reducing its population by the same. Millions of ethnic Hungarians were now living in newly created neighboring states, leading to a massive territorial disintegration and a significant sense of loss and humiliation for the Hungarian people. The Treaty of Trianon not only dismantled the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but also left Hungary as a diminished and fragmented nation. The loss of key industrial regions, agricultural lands and historical regions left the country economically weakened and with a deep sense of injustice. During the tumultuous period of World War II, Hungary found itself straddling a geopolitical fault line. Its decision to align with the Axis powers, especially Germany, was driven largely by its ambition to reclaim territories that had been lost to neighboring states such as Romania and Bulgaria. Yet this allegiance was to prove costly. When both Romania and Bulgaria switched allegiances to join the Allies, Hungary was left exposed to the impeding threat of Soviet domination. Fearing Hungary's imminent betrayal, Germany moved in to occupy the country. This significantly undermined Hungary's sovereignty and forced the nation to comply with directives of the German regime. By the end of 1944, Hungary had transformed into a war-torn battlefield caught in the crossfires between the retreating German forces and the advancing Soviet Red Army. The prospects of an independent Hungary were increasingly eclipsed by the reality of war. Following the fall of Budapest to the besieging Soviet forces, Hungary fell firmly under the Soviet sphere. They proceeded to install a communist puppet government, marking the beginning of a period of extreme hardship and repression for the Hungarian populace. The dream of an independent Hungary was gradually fading into oblivion under the Soviet's iron fist. This oppressive regime, combined with a growing desire for national independence, fueled resentment and resistance amongst the populace. The tensions simmered until they reached a boiling point and in 1956, protests and uprisings erupted across Hungary as people sought to break free from Soviet control and establish a self-governing Hungary. On November 4, 1956, Soviet tanks and troops invaded with the intent of crushing the revolution 
and restoring absolute communist control. The brutal and indiscriminate use of force shocked the world and caused immense suffering and loss of lives. Flaring swiftly from student demonstrations into open revolution, the pent-up hatreds of oppression sent Russian might reeling and forced withdrawal of the red yoke. But even as these scenes were recorded, rumors flared of the re-entry of Russian forces and new fighting. The beautiful city of Budapest, scarred by conflict, again faces a Russian onslaught, even before the debris of the fight for freedom is cleared from the streets. In startling developments, Hungary broke with the satellite Warsaw Pact military alliance, announced neutrality, and pleaded for priority on the United Nations agenda. Then word came that Russian forces were massing, and all communication with the West was cut off. The revolution lasted for less than two weeks, but it left a deep impact on the national consciousness. The revolution's failure to achieve its goals and the subsequent brutal suppression by Soviet forces brought a sense of betrayal and disillusionment amongst the Hungarian people. Thousands of Hungarians were killed, many more were arrested, imprisoned or forced into exile. Thus, Hungary's tumultuous journey through history, marked by shifting alliances, foreign occupations and internal struggles, left the nation grappling with the elusive dream of independence. The specters of World War II and the Soviet era continued to cast a long shadow over Hungary, shaping its political landscape and its people's quest for self-determination. Even as the dream of a free Hungary was crushed in 1956, the desire for freedom behind it never perished. From the late 1960s until 1989, Hungary featured one of the most liberal communist regimes whose political ties and financial indebtedness to the West began to grow from the early 1980s. It was famously dubbed as Goulash Communism. And then the Soviet Union's declining economic situation would open a window of opportunity. As Gorbachev became the leader of the Soviet Union in 1985, his policy of reform planned to save the Soviet Union from internal collapse by loosening its grip over the Eastern Bloc. Amidst this tumultuous backdrop, dialogue was initiated with the once persecuted Hungarian political opposition, paving the way for a paradigm shift towards democratic governance. Then the Soviets, in a significant departure from their previous interventionist stance, announced their policy of non-interference in the affairs of Eastern Bloc nations. This assurance meant that Hungary's democratic reforms would not incite a forceful Soviet response, as had tragically occurred during the uprisings of 1956. This policy change provided a much-needed safety net for Hungary's political metamorphosis, ensuring that the path to democracy remained unobstructed. As the nation prepared for its impeding elections in August 1989, it was also engaged in negotiations to ease travel restrictions with Western countries. This move signified the first crack in the formidable Iron Curtain, the political boundary dividing Europe during the Cold War. In a historic moment that would forever reshape the world map, the Iron Curtain was first torn open near the Hungarian village of Hegia Shalom in May 1989. This event symbolized the beginning of the end for the oppressive divide that had split Europe for decades. The following month, on June 27th, Hungarian and Austrian officials, in a joint effort, ceremoniously cut an opening into the Iron Curtain at Sopron. This was not just a symbolic gesture, but a clear announcement of Hungary's determination to dismantle its border surveillance systems. This act was a stepping stone towards freedom, a testament to Hungary's resolve to break free from the constraints of its past, and a beacon of hope for other nations yearning for liberation. It marked a pivotal moment in history, setting the stage for the eventual collapse of the Iron Curtain and the ushering in of a new era of democracy and independence for Eastern Europe. The unraveling of the Iron Curtain by Hungary would also contribute to the reunification of Germany as an unintended consequence. As East Germans fled to the West through Hungary, their government was forced to loosen its own border controls in response. However, a mistake resulting from the hasty implementation of these changes would bring down the Berlin Wall, which would hasten German reunification. 
the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party would in October 1989 implement nearly 100 constitutional amendments to turn the Hungarian People's Republic into the Republic of Hungary, ending Hungarian subservience to Moscow, while the party would change itself to the Hungarian Socialist Party. In the first three modern Hungarian elections in 1990, the rebranded Socialist Party would lose against the center-right Hungarian Democratic Forum Party, which together with the stationed Soviet troops leaving Hungary between 1990 and 1991 marked the end of Soviet control. The Hungarian transition to Western-style democracy would be one of the smoothest in the former Soviet bloc, especially when compared to the protests of the Czechoslovakian Velvet Revolution, the violent revolution in Romania, and the wars in Yugoslavia. Throughout the 1990s, Hungary was one of the pioneers of democratic and economic transition in Central and Eastern Europe a fact recognized by the country being included in the first round of both NATO's Eastern Enlargement in 1999 and that of the European Union in 2004. The democratically elected governments of the 1990s privatized state-owned companies, liberalized the markets, attracted foreign investments and restructured the economy, which became dominated by private and internationally competitive companies. However, as of 2001, the country's competitiveness began to wane, while its fiscal stability and indebtedness worsened due to the stalling reforms in many policy sectors, including social care and health care. Then 2008 hit. It was a hard time. Democracy, it seemed, wasn't quite living up to the promises, giving more radical forces a chance to grab power. In 2010, after a political scandal and anti-government protests, the right-wing Fidesz party, led by Viktor Orban, won the Hungarian elections by effectively tapping into the widespread dissatisfaction amongst the people. Despite securing only 52% of the vote, Fidesz managed to gain 67% of the seats in the government, thanks to a flaw in Hungary's electoral system. This gave them a supermajority granting them the power to pass laws and make constitutional changes without significant opposition. Since then, Fidesz has exerted significant control over the media, the Supreme Court, and even changed the electoral system in their favor. This consolidation of power has led to a decline in media freedom. Through controlling the media, Orban has the power to create a positive image for himself, while in turn displaying the opposition in the worst light possible. According to the 2023 World Press Freedom Index, Hungary is ranked 72nd out of 180 countries, a decline of some 50 places since 2010. Independent news coverage in Hungary has significantly declined, leaving only a few online and print newspapers, along with two mostly independent private TV stations that covered the entire nation. Furthermore, Orban's government uses a populist narrative to create divisions within Hungarian society, painting certain groups such as the EU, migrants, civil society organizations and the LGBT community as public enemies. This tactic helps strengthen Fidesz's position and distracts from its creeping authoritarian tendencies. The result is a system marked by corruption and a population with growing skepticism towards both their own government and the EU. The erosion of trust towards the Hungarian government, together with economic problems caused by corruption, has prompted many of Hungary's young and educated to seek better opportunities abroad. While Hungary's entry into the EU was based on democratic values and the rule of law, Fidesz's centralization of power has led to a violation of these principles. The EU has attempted to hold Hungary accountable through Article 7, which allows for the suspension of certain rights from a member state found in serious breach. However, Poland's support has thwarted these efforts. Poland, facing similar accusations of democratic backsliding, stood by Hungary, thwarting the EU's attempt to discipline it. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the EU found a way to pressure Hungary by tying funding to adherence to democratic norms. This conditionality serves as a tool for the EU to uphold its democratic standards, especially given the economic impact of the pandemic on countries like Hungary. The struggle over democratic backsliding will persist between the EU and Hungary, as their interests remain in opposition. 
Meanwhile, Hungary remains determined to concentrate all power around the ruling party at the expense of democracy. Historically, Orban's stance towards Russia has shifted over time. As a member of the opposition, he was a vocal critic of Moscow, asserting that oil may come from the east, but freedom always comes from the west. However, his views softened around 2009, notably after his victory in the 2010 elections. There are striking similarities in the political strategies employed by both Viktor Orban and Vladimir Putin. Following the Putin model, Orban has systematically dismantled the checks and balances that once restricted his power. He has replaced numerous independent officials with his loyalists, and through his network of oligarchs, Orban has gained control over significant parts of the Hungarian media. The ruling party operates an advanced system of coordinated internet trolling, reminiscent of Russia's infamous troll factories. Despite the political similarities, Russia's influence over the Hungarian public is relatively weak. The two countries do not share a common border or a language, and their shared history is far from harmonious. However, public opinion polls in Hungary paint a complex picture. Approximately 35% of Hungarians consider Russia as their country's most important strategic partner, compared to just 13% for the United States. Nevertheless, Russia does not present an appealing alternative for the majority of Hungarian society. According to a 2022 survey, 38% of Hungarians prefer a Western orientation, while the majority would like to see Hungary positioned somewhere between the West and East, perhaps something in line with what Turkey is doing. But overall, Hungary seems to be transforming into a more westwards-leaning country. As in 2021, only 32% of respondents preferred westwards orientation. Recognizing that the Hungarian public is not particularly interested in deepening its ties with Russia, Kremlin's focus has been on tying Hungary to Russia economically. Approximately 80% of Hungary's natural gas and 65% of its oil imports are sourced from Russia making energy cooperation a crucial aspect for their relationship. The contentious agreement with Moscow to enlarge Hungary's Pax nuclear power plant, which while shrouded in secrecy, underscores the economic cooperation at hand. Hungary has consistently criticized EU sanctions against Russia, but while Budapest has never vetoed any of them, the resistance certainly complicates the introduction of additional punitive measures. Given the many similarities between the Russian and Hungarian political systems, it's tempting to view Hungary as Russia's Trojan horse in Europe. However, the reality is more complex. Despite the growing ties with Russia, Hungary remains firmly ingrained in both the EU and NATO, and there is no political will or public support to alter this relationship. Viktor Orban, while praising Russia as an illiberal model of ruling and engaging in lucrative business deals with the country, has not shown any willingness to compromise on Hungary's sovereignty or his power. Orban certainly has autocratic tendencies. His political objectives clash with the EU and its liberal doctrines. At the same time, his economic alliances with Russia and Turkey are likely forcing him into some uncomfortable situations. But it does not appear that he is some kind of a Russian Trojan horse. As the Eastern Bloc began to collapse under economic problems, it opened a window of opportunity for Hungary to achieve its freedom. This dream had failed in 1920, 1944 and 1956. And perhaps it was this dream which allowed Hungary to lead the way in dismantling the Iron Curtain in 1989. Historically, Hungary and Russia have shared a tumultuous relationship characterized by periods of cooperation and conflict. The Soviet-era occupation of Hungary left deep-seated mistrust towards Russia. However, under the leadership of Prime Minister Viktor Orban, Hungary adopted a more pragmatic approach, driven by economic considerations and frustrations with the EU. Hungary would join the West through NATO and the European Union. But ironically, it would be Orban who would be in charge of dismantling the dream of democracy for his own benefit having supported free elections during the late communist era of Hungary. In foreign policy, the Biden administration assigns high priority to democracy on its political agenda and sees autocratization, corruption and close ties to authoritarian powers like Russia and China as key threats to transatlantic security. Since Hungary scores high in all these fields, 
Budapest may come under significant pressure from Washington. The relationship between Viktor Orban and Russia is a fascinating study of political realignment, economic interdependence and strategic maneuvering, which likely serves Hungary's short-term interests. The long-term implications of this relationship on the international stage remain to be seen, however. Many experts view Hungary's stance during the war in Ukraine as indicative of a broader trend of EU and NATO members grappling with the challenge of dealing with Russia. According to Robert D. Kaplan, a geopolitics expert, Hungary's balancing act is a classic example of real politik, choosing national interest over ideological commitment. It underscores the difficult choices countries face when dealing with an assertive Russia. As Orban continues to navigate the murky waters of geopolitics, his decisions will undoubtedly shape not only Hungary's future, but also the dynamics within all of Europe. It's too early to tell where all this is going, but I'm especially curious to see what he will say if Russia faces defeat in Ukraine. Forget the fact, Russia is 140 million people, Ukraine is 30. Next, you could fill in quite a few more gaps in your knowledge by watching my video on Greater Romania. And this is my Patreon map. Everyone here is a legend. Thank you all so much for your support. Geoperspective, out.